Or if you turn with me this evening to the book of Proverbs, chapter 16. I want to preach a, a message this evening titled Freemasonry. And in the 19 and a half years I've been here, we've preached on this twice, I believe. In several years, we did write an article on it in 2002. And it's laying right here. And I want you to notice as we come to Proverbs chapter 16, this evening, you're going to see me shuffling through notes and, and quotes and things of that nature. Be patient with me, because I want to quote from their authorities. I want to quote from Henry Wilson Coles, that is the Coles Masonic Encyclopedia, Albert Mackey, Albert uh, Mackey's Encyclopedia of Freemasonry, Albert Pike, Morals and Dogma, he was a Confederate Civil War general, and Clawson, which is commentaries on morals and dogmas. Laying here on the pulpit is this material. Also have an Alabama 1943 Masonic Manual. Also have a Masonic Bible laying here. And so this is the material that we have here before. So what I want to do, instead of tell you what I think that they believe, is to do my best to quote from their authorities this evening. Will you allow me to do that? And just be patient with me. And I'm not going to use everything I got here because some of you got to go to work in the morning. And, and so what we'll do is go as far as we can, give you as many quotes as we can. Now you notice with me as we come to this passage in Proverbs chapter 16, in verse 25, this verse is mentioned twice in the Bible. It's also in chapter 14. God says here, he said, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Father, we thank you this evening for this time that you've given us together. Lord, we ask now for your anointing and blessing to be upon the reading of Scripture. Thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Lord, we ask tonight you would teach us, open our hearts. For in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Freemasonry is a false religious organization that has its roots in paganism. I want to begin by saying that. It is a mixture of Gnosticism, occultism, witchcraft, mythology, and many other religions. It is unscriptural. And it is Antichrist. So we'll go ahead and get those things out of the way. Now I gave you the sources that we're going to be quoting from this evening. And as you see me turn uh, pages here, I'll be making decisions as, as to exactly which quotes that I'll be using as I go along. So some of the words I'll just will be mine. Many of these words will uh, be quotes from other authors. And I may not even give you the source for time's sake. Now the origin... Of Freemasonry is much debated by many people. There's different views. It is claimed by some that Noah and Enoch passed on the secrets of Masonry, and it is generally claimed that King Solomon himself organized a Masonic lodge. In other words, Freemasonry believes that the name of God was lost, and they have the light and the recovering of God's name. Masonry gives the impression that it dates back many centuries. But speaking from one encyclopedia, the Encyclopedia Britannica, they say that it began no earlier than 1717 A.D. And the degrees of the Scottish Rite were set in order in 1762. And it came to America's soil in 1733, 16 years later. The name masonry is basically taken from those who have worked in stone. Uh, I spent eight years as a brick mason in the state of Tennessee, and I joke with people and say, I'm a true mason. These others are phonies. But basically, there are those who say that it began with those who worked in masonry, and, it had, and the, uh, the craft actually in, evolved into a religious setting. And so they use the tools of the craft today of the trade to symbolize certain truths. 
Now, here's the outline I want to give you this evening. And I decided, since we wrote this article in 2002, that's about seven years ago, that I would follow the outline pretty much in the article. Number one, we're going to speak about the lodge and religion. Number two, we're going to talk about the lodge and the Bible. The lodge and salvation, number three. The lodge and God, number four. The lodge and Jesus Christ. Number six, the lodge and the unequal yoke. Number seven, the lodge and oaths. And number eight, the lodge and secrecies. Now, those are the things that we're going to try to cover uh, here this evening. Now, let's read this verse again, and we're going to turn to the book of Matthew in chapter 16. And as we go through these points, we're going to turn and read one verse, because there's eight uh, different points I'm going to go through tonight. And so we're going to read one verse for each one, and I may refer to some other scriptures as we go through this. Now, notice the Bible says here in Proverbs 16 and verse 25, very important verse. It says, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. We may be sincere, but we can still be, what, sincerely wrong in our belief system. So this is why we pray, we seek God, and we study His Word, and we plead with God for truth. Now turn with me to the book of Matthew, and I'm going to be reading in Matthew chapter 16. Now first of all, this evening, the Lodge and religion. Now, the reason I'm coming uh, and using this title is that we know that the church is the only ordained institution of God in the New Testament. The lodge is a man-made institution. And the religion of masonry is not Christian, as I've already stated. Many lodge members contend with people like you and I and they say that Freemasonry is not a religion. It's just a fraternity or so forth. They say it's not a religion. And so that gives them um, lead way to be a part of a church and also a part of the lodge. But the problem with that is that Freemasonry is a religion. And as we go to their authorities, those who over the years have written books on the subject of Freemason, those who were 33 degree Masons and have written books, they say that Freemasonry is a religion. Now, Webster's Dictionary defines religion as a belief in a divine or superhuman power to be obeyed and worshipped as the creator and rule ruler of the universe. Now, what about the lodges, before we read here in the Bible. I made a list some years ago, and other books and pamphlets and so forth I've read have done the same thing. There are some good material on Freemasonry that are available today. And But when you come and consider the subject of Freemasonry, we find that the building that they meet in is called a temple, where they offer prayers to a deity the great architect of the universe. They kneel at their sacred altar to make sacred vows. On that sacred altar is placed the Bible or some other sacred book. They have chaplains, they have priests, and they have worshipful masters. Sure sounds like a religious organization to me. One cannot join the lodge unless he swears belief in a supreme being. Now, you don't have to be a Christian uh, to be a lodge member, and most are not Christians, but you do have to believe in a supreme being. In masonry, there is teachings about the celestial lodge above and the immortality of the soul. I'm reading this because this sounds like a religious organization to me. Masons are to be obedient to the worshipful master who has hanging over his head in the lodge a big letter, G, which signifies deity. In the lodges, there are ceremonies, rituals, symbols, and theology. A couple other quotes you remind me to read in Matthew 16. All right? Matthew's Encyclopedia of Freemasonry. Have it here on the pulpit. 
He says Freemasonry may rightfully claim to be called a religious institution. The tendency of all true Freemasonry is toward religion. Look at its ancient landmark, its sublime ceremonies, its profound symbols and allegories. Calls, Masonic Encyclopedia states, Freemasonry certainly requires a belief in the existence of and man's dependence upon a supreme being to whom he is responsible. What can a church add to that except to bring into one fellowship those who have like feelings? That is exactly what the Lodge does. I'm saying to you, as well as their authorities, it is a religious organization that is contrary to Holy Scripture. Calls use over 15,000 words to show that Freemasonry is a religion and that Freemasonry fits the definition of a church. And again, I've dealt with many over the years that they have denied this. We've had some come into this church, some have left, some have gotten saved and renounced the lodge over the years. It is a religious organization. Quoting a few others, this same uh, uh, Masonic Encyclopedia, says Freemasonry has a religious service to commit the body of a deceased brother to the dust whence it came and to speed the liberated spirit back to the great source of light. Many Freemasons make the flight with no other guarantee of safe landing than their belief in the religion of Freemasonry. Now, I'm just giving you just a few quotes. There's many more, and I would uh, let you read these authorities here if you were not satisfied. In Matthew chapter 16, we will read from one verse in this chapter. Again, I'm going to try to read one verse for each point. That is eight points. And then we'll have a, a conclusion in, in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24. But I want you to notice with me that in Matthew 16 and verse 18, I said there's only one divine institution in the New Testament. And he says here in this passage, he says, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There is no room for any kind of fraternities or lodges or clubs or anything else. I've never been the member that I can think of of anything since I've been a Christian except God's church the local church. That's the only thing that I will join. I told somebody Friday, we were talking about this, and I was joking, but I said, I don't care if it's a goose lodge, a duck lodge, uh, uh, it doesn't matter what it is. And I went through a list of names, and I said, it doesn't matter. I said, Christians are not to belong to them. They're to belong to God's church. Now, turn with me, please, to John chapter 12. Quoting again on the subject of the lodge and religion. This is a quote from Mackey's Encyclopedia of Freemasonry. He said, The religion of Masonry is not sectarian. It admits men of every creed. Please listen to my words as I quote these men. It admits men of every creed within the hospitable bosom, rejecting none and approving none for its particular faith. It is not Judaism, though there is nothing in it to offend the Jews. It is not Christianity, but there is nothing in it re repugnant to the faith of the Christian. Its religion is that general one of nature and primitive revelation handed down to us from ancient and patriarchal priesthood in which men may agree and none may differ. The problem with Freemasonry is that they can worship any god, for Masonry has no cross, no blood, and no salvation. Now, you'll notice with me in John chapter 12. Let me read one verse from this chapter. And number two, the Lodge and the Bible. The Lodge and the Bible. Now, before I read... We know that the Bible is a part of the furniture 
in the lodge. It's always on the altar and open, even quoted from in some of its rituals. But does Masonry believe it is to be the supreme religious book for Masons? The answer is no. They do not believe that. Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses and others quote from the Bible, do they not? Satan came to the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 4, 6, quoting the Old Testament. Now, the Bible is not the authoritative book of the Masonic Lodge, but it is only a symbol. It's only a symbol. The Mason is not required to believe the Bible's entire teaching. For other religious books may be substituted for a Bible and placed on the altar. In the United States lodges, in most part, the Bible is on the altar and not the Koran. But I want you to listen as I continue to, uh, to, to uh, elaborate on this and give you a few quotes here this evening about this. Now, let's, let's first of all read from Matthew, I'm sorry, from John, and I'm not even there yet because I'm looking over these quotes. John chapter 12. Let's first of all read here, and then I'll give you several other quotes on this particular area. In John chapter 12, and in verse 48, the Lord said, He that rejecteth me, and receiveth not my words, hath one that judges him the word that I have spoken the same, so judge him in the last day. We know that according to Revelation 22 and Proverbs 30, that if anyone adds to God's word or takes away from God's word, that God will judge them. He says in Revelation 22, verse 18 and 19, those who take away from God's word, uh, that uh, their names would be taken away, or their part would be taken out of the book of life. He said that those who will add to the Word of God, that God shall add the plagues that are mentioned in the book to that individual. In the Masonic Lodge, in, I'm sorry, the Masonic Bible, and here it is, I have it in my hand. In the Masonic Bible, in the front of it, in the preface, it reads like this. In masonry, now some of this sounds good. You've got to, you've got to really look at it. In masonry, the Bible, so rich in symbolism, is itself a symbol for the book of faith. The will of God as man hath learned in the midst of the years, and by the very honor which masonry pays to the Bible, it teaches us to receive every book of faith. Now, as I read, listen to what I'm saying. To receive every book of faith in which men find help for today and hope for tomorrow. Or the morrow, rather. Joining with a man of Islam as he takes oath on the Koran, and with a Hindu as he makes covenant with God upon the book he loves best, for masonry knows what so many forget that religious that religions are many, but religion is one. Therefore masonry invites to its altar men of all faiths, knowing that if they use different names for the nameless one of a hundred names, they are yet praying to the one God and Father of all, knowing also that while they read different volumes, they are in fact reading the same vast book of the faith of man. Did you get, pick up anything in that? Albert Pike, who is quoted in Masonic Monitor in the state of Georgia, Georgia says, The Bible is an indispensable part of the furniture. I emphasize that word. That's all it is. He says the Bible is an indispensable part of the furniture of the Christian lodge only because it is the sacred book of the Christian religion. The Hebrew Pentateuch is a, in a Hebrew lodge and the Koran in a 
handed one belong on the altar. The obligation of the candidate is always to be taken on the sacred book or books of his religion that he may deem it more solemn and binding, and therefore if it was that you asked of what religion you are, we have no other concern with your religious creed. Now here's what he means when he says this. The only reason that there is a Bible on the altar in the United States across our land, supposedly a Christian nation, Now, you could go in some lodges in other cities, bigger cities, like Atlanta and places, and you'll find lodges that would have the Bible and the Koran. But the only reason that the Bible is used in the lodge for those who claim to be Christians is to get them to swear allegiance to the lodge on the sacred book that they believe in. The same is true with the Muslim and the Koran. That's the only reason it's there, is to get the added individual to swear on that sacred book. Now, I'll ask you to be turning to Ephesians 2. Let me give you, before we go to our third point, let me elaborate on this just a little bit more. A study by the Southern Baptists on Freemasonry states, and by the way, they did a study on this several years ago, We address this on talk shows and the radio and things like that, but they did not follow through on what needed to be done. But here's their study that they did. They said the the Koran may be used in lodges where Muslims are members or guests, the Vedas in lodges where Hindus are members or guests, the Grand Lodge of Israel places the Hebrew Bible, the New Testament, and the Koran on its altar, in some lodges in India and Singapore, several scriptures may be opened during the ceremony. All right? So then Masons, they regard the Bible as only one of many sacred books. Now, can you do that here today and be a Christian? No. It's impossible. The Bible is called a greater light of masonry. It it is only one of the great lights of masonry. Now listen to this. The Masonic ritual for the Grand Lodge of Alabama, 1963, page 79, states, I quote, Lodges or masters objecting to the use of selections from the New Testament may omit the above paragraph. Meaning, unquote. Now, meaning, what do they mean? You can omit the New Testament portion of the ritual if you want or if somebody else objects. In other words, you can take it or leave it. And they, um, I don't know where I, I may run across this a little bit later, but they remove the Lord Jesus Christ from certain verses that is quoted in some of their ceremonies. Here's another quote from one of these authorities. says, The prevailing Masonic opinion is that the Bible is only a symbol of the divine will, law, or revelation, and not that its contents are divine law, inspired or revealed. So far, no responsible authority has held that a Freemason must believe the Bible or any part of it. Now, number Three, the Lodge and Salvation. The Lodge and Salvation. Now, just because somebody believes in God or a God does not make them a Christian. Am I correct? James 2 says, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. We must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ in order to be saved. There's no way around this. Freemasonry teaches a false plan of salvation. In the lodge, the plan of salvation is completely distorted. In essence, Freemasonry teaches the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, which is basically out of the pits of hell when separated from the Lord Jesus Christ. 
The only brotherhood is through the blood of Christ, is it not? Now, the deceased at a funeral is not preached into the kingdom of God at a Masonic funeral, but they're preached into the celestial lodge above. I want you to listen. We're going to read in Ephesians chapter 2, and I'm going to give you some more quotes. See, I, 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 I hope this will not be boring to you this evening, but I'm giving you what they say, their authorities. In Ephesians 2, the Bible says here clearly, in verse 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Salvation is a free gift through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's not by what we have done, but it's by what Christ has done for us. It is a free gift. All right? How many of you are familiar with the aprons that are wore, worn rather by the Masons? Have you ever seen one? Well, the apron, the lambskin, is the badge of Masons. It is a symbol of purity to them. They wear it in their Masonic services, and they're even buried with it on. I want a mason to the Lord, an older man, many years ago. The lovely man enjoyed being around him. He denounced the Masonic Lodge. He was trusting in it for his salvation. I went to this house on a day, on a weekly basis for a few years, and he finally trusted the Lord as his Savior and denounced it. And the Masons got very angry with me and the family because that we would not allow them to participate in the funeral and we would not allow them to put the apron on him in the casket. Now, they think very highly of this. This is their salvation. The Encyclopedia of Freemasonry, under the heading of the subject of apron, states, quote, by the lambskin, the mason is reminded of that purity of life and conduct which is so essentially necessary to his gaining admission into the celestial lodge above where the supreme architect of the universe forever presides. In the Masonic burial service adopted by the Grand Lodge of Texas in 1930, page 13 and 14, is the following statement in the Master's Oration at the Grave. Quote, This apron we deposit in the grave of our brother as a reminder of our unity in service, of the common destiny that beckons us hence, of the Masonic spirit of universality that linked us as brothers. Now, there's some other things in here that is said, but basically... And toward the end of this, he said, "In that born as we are into one great brotherhood, no circumstance of chance or achievement shall serve to separate us in eternity. This is a symbol of their salvation. I'll give you just one or two other quotes on this, and we'll go to our fourth point. In all 50 states, all Masonic ritual books, promise Masonic candidates in the first three degrees to remember what is the badge of a Mason, that is the apron, and to remind the Mason of the purity of life and conduct which is necessary to his obtaining the celestial lodge above. One other quote, if we wear it, that is the apron, without soul or blemish, you will be received at the pearly gates of heaven and there be presented with the pure robe of righteousness. Now, this is some wicked stuff when you really analyze it in light of the Word of God. Now, turn to 1 Kings chapter 18, number 4. I've got to keep moving. I don't want to get in a hurry, but I've got to keep moving. 1 Kings chapter 18. The fourth thing is the lodge 
and the and the Lord God. First Kings 18. I'm going to read one verse again. I'm trying to keep uh, the scripture reading one verse for each point. The lodge and the Lord God. Now Israel in the Bible, in the passage we're going to read from, their sin was not a total rejecting of Jehovah God. But their sin was combining the worship of Jehovah God and Baal. So the God of Masonry is not the God of the Bible or the God of Christianity. And their authorities will tell you that. Masons have joined Jehovah God with other false deities. The Masonic Lodge mingles the name of God with pagan deities, which the Bible forbids. And again, we're going to take one verse here that will illustrate this. And I'm going to quote here from Albert Pike in just a moment. Let me read the verse. In 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 21, And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. And if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. They're trying to serve God and Baal. And they mingled together the worship of Jehovah God, the God of the Bible, and Baal, the God of the Canaanites and the Babylonians. Albert Pike makes this statement on page 222 in Morals and Dogma. He says, quote, Masonry, around whose altar the Christian, the Hebrew, the Muslim, the Brahmin, the followers of Confucian, Confucius, rather, and I'm going to, I'm going to just spell this word out because I have mispronounced it a few times. Z-O-R-O-A-S-T-E-R. Saying all of these said they can assemble as brethren. Now think about this. The Hebrew, the Christian, the Muslim, the Brahmin, the followers of Confucius. They can all assemble together as brethren and unite in prayer to the one God who is above all the Balaam must leave it to each of the initiates to look for the foundation of his faith and hope to the written scriptures of his own religion. Pike has included the God of Christianity in a category of false gods. Baal is a god or an idol of the heathen in the Bible. The letter G above the chair in the east alludes supposedly to geometry. There's some other studies been done on that. And they say this represents how God created the world. They call God deity or grand architect of the universe. The teaching of Freemasonry leads to a universal religion. The bottom line. Exodus 23, I'm not asking you to turn there, tells us that we're not to worship other gods. Now, Isaiah 42, verse 8, says that God Himself, He alone is God. The God of masonry is a composite deity. Jehovah, Baal, and Osiris rolled into one under the initials of J-B-O. And if you've ever, I've seen the rituals, I've seen some of their ceremonies acted out. We used to have material here uh, that that we showed that, and I don't know whatever happened to it, but we had some good material on that. And here's what happens: the real name of God is not told to those coming in the masonry until the initiate has reached the royal arts degree. It is here that the secret name of the deity of masonry is revealed. The royal arch mason, the seventh degree, is told that the true name for God is Jobulon, J A O B U. L-O-N, and it is explained in this way. J-A-O is the Greek word for Jehovah. B-U-L is a rendering of the name Baal. And O-N is the term used in the Egyptian mysteries to call upon the deity Osiris. So the secret ritual book of the craft prints an abbreviation of this word as follows. J O, I'm sorry, J B O. Do you see what they're doing? John chapter 5. 
Number five. The laws in Jesus Christ. First John 2.23, the Bible said, Whosoever denies the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledges the Son hath the Father also. Jesus in the Masonic Lodge is put on the same level with Buddha, Mohammed, Confucius, Vishnu, Osiris, and many others. Masonry does not teach that Jesus was the divine Son of God. And that faith in him alone is the way to be saved. The laws prohibits all discussions of Christ during the ceremonies and in the fellowship time immediately after. Now, there's a few small lodges out in the countries and whatever where that, you know, they get by a little bit with talking about Jesus. But Jesus Christ, the Son of Almighty God, God manifest in the flesh, is not a part of masonry. Jesus' name is deleted from key scriptures, verses used in the Sonic rituals as in 2 Thessalonians 3.12, in the Lord Jesus Christ, 2 Thessalonians 3.6, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Peter 2.5, by Jesus Christ. Freemasonry, in one Masonic ritual, it states, we meet this day to commemorate the death of Jesus, not as inspired or divine, for well, that is not for us to decide. John chapter 5. By the way, Jews who believed that Jesus Christ was the only, was only the bastard son of a Jewish harlot are welcomed into the lodge with Muslims and everyone else. In John chapter 5 and verse 23, we have these words. He says here that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. And he that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father, which hath sent him. We must honor the Son. In Morals and Dogma, written by Albert Pike, which is a standard reference book of the Masonic Law, states on page 525, it, referring to masonry, reverences all the great reformers. It sees Moses and Confucius, and this word I spell, Z-O-R-O-A-S-T-E-R, Jesus of Nazareth, the great uh, teachers of morality, the eminent reformers, in no more as allows every brother of the order to assign to each such higher and each divine character as his creed and truth require. Does this sound a little bit like New Age? You, you know, you come into this thing, you can believe in any, you can bring any God you want into this organization as long as your God is not supreme. You can be a part of the New Age and believe in Jesus as long as it's not the Jesus of the Bible who is God manifest in the flesh. Praying in Jesus' name is prohibited, especially if someone objects to it in the lodge. The policy worldwide is that if some find Jesus' name in prayer offensive, they are not to use it. Not one prayer in the first three degrees is open or closed in Jesus' name. The two Masonic burial services adopted in 1921 and 1930 to the Grand Lodge of Texas, in them they are ten separate prayers, not counting the Lord's Prayer in each. And in the ten prayers, the name of Jesus Christ is not mentioned. The majority of lodges refuse to let Christians pray in Jesus' name. Second Corinthians 6. Number six. It's a hellish organization. Have you figured that out yet? Second Corinthians chapter six, reading from verse fourteen. Number six, the lodge and the unequal yoke. lady got saved here in the church many years ago in the beginnings of this church, and she stood up one Sunday and she said, will you help me get out of it? I had preached on it. that she, I said, I will help you get out of it. 
Notice as we come here to this passage. Now, is it wrong to call an unconverted man a brother? Help me out. Yes. They call each other brothers no matter what religion they're from. The lodge yoke, now listen to me carefully, quoting again, is as binding as any relationship on earth. The lodge oath is presumed to be more sacred than the marriage vow. It supersedes the duty of a man to his church, to fellow citizens, or even his pastor. They are sworn not to discuss the so-called secrets of the lodge with even his pastor, the shepherd whom God placed over his soul. They swear to show partiality to Masons over those not Masons and bind himself to show a preference to his lodge brothers. Now, there's many verses. In Second John 9, Whosoever transgresseth, abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ hath both the Father and the Son. There's many verses that bear out that we should not be unequally yoked. But I'm going to read here in this passage. You'll notice with me as we come here, Second Corinthians 6, reading from verse 14. He says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. He said in verse 17, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Okay? Turn to Matthew 5. Number 7. Number 7. Hang on to your seat. Number 7. We're getting close. Matthew 5, reading from verse 34. The lodge and oaths. Now, this is a biggie right here. If for no other reason you would forsake this ungodly, wicked, hellish organization, if for no other reason you must deny it for this reason right here, the lodge and oaths. We're to swear not at all, right? That's a command that God's given the child of God. James 5.12 says, Swear not. Matthew 14.7, Herod, for an oath say, beheaded John the Baptist against his own heart and conscience. Read that and check it out. He made an oath, made a vow, made a promise. Notice in Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 34, we have these words. But I say unto you, it's the Sermon on the Mount, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is His footstool, neither, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great King. Neither, swear, neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be, yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. Now listen carefully. The lodge, oath, calls men to obligate themselves to other lodge members that are not even Christians. Oaths vary in the different degrees of the Masonic order. There's 33 degrees. The first three of the blue lodge. The Masonic binds himself to oaths, now listen, that are bloody, that are unchristian, that are criminal, and that are blasphemous. The penalties of breaking oaths is death. I doubt if they kill very many, but it is death, the penalty. And they have killed some in the past. When the initiative, well, I'm sorry, when initiated into the entered apprentice degree, the oath reads, I will always hail, even conceal and never reveal any of the secret arts, parts or points of the hidden mysteries of, the, of ancient Freemasonry, which have been 
heretofore may to at this time or shall at any future period be communicated to me as such. Now listen as a read little father. This may shock some of you if you've not heard anything on this. Throughout the initiation, rituals of the Blue Lodge and throughout the 33 degrees of Freemasonry, the candidates are sworn to secrecies, secrecies rather, by bloody oaths. Such as the oath sworn by the entered apprentice or the first degree binding myself under no less penalty than that of having my throat cut across, my tongue torn out by its roots, and my body burned in the rough Buried rather in the rough sands of the sea at low water mark. Oh, I want to make that oath, don't you? You've got to be kidding me. The master mason swears having my body severed in two, my bowels taken from thence and burned to ashes, and the ashes scattered before the four winds of heaven. This is ungodly. One oath is taken in the presence of three men with drawn swords, one with the point to the, of the sword on, the, on his throat, another one to the heart, and another one drawn across his bowels, and in that position he binds himself under the penalty of having his throat cut and his tongue taken out, his breast ripped open and his heart cut out, and his body severed in twain and disemboweled. Amazing. Turn with me to John chapter 18. John chapter 18. Number 8. Got number 8 and then a conclusion. Number 8. The Lodge and Secrecy. Turn with me to John chapter 18. One verse from this chapter. Let me give you three other verses. Jesus had nothing to do with secret doctrines, rites, or symbols. Remember the verse we read this morning in Luke chapter 12? Very similar uh, to others in the Bible. In Matthew 5, 15 and 16, Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light to all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Matthew 10, 26 and 27. Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak you in light and what you hear in the ear, that preach you from the housetops. In Ephesians 5, 11 and 12. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. The Lodge and Secrecies. The Lodge says to its members, keep the message secret. Jesus says to his disciples, tell everybody. Okay, two total opposite philosophies. Masons are sworn not to discuss things of masonry even with their wife and with their children. They're sworn to this. They say, tell no one except Lodge brothers, those who have paid for the right to hear, tell not these lessons to your wife or sons. Quoting. Matthew 28, 19 says, I want you to go in all the world, preach to all nations, baptizing them, teaching them. Revelation 22, 17, we quoted that this morning. There's an invitation given there to all. To all. Matthew chapter 18. Notice with me in verse 20. Matthew chapter 18 in verse 20. And Jesus answered him, I spake openly to the world. I even taught in their synagogues and in the temple, whether the Jews always resort. And in secret have I said what? Nothing. Jesus Christ preached the gospel. He wants us to preach the gospel. Everybody you meet this week, tell them about the saving faith and the blood of Jesus Christ. That's His commission that He's given to us. In conclusion, 
Turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. I've been real good tonight. I've avoided many of the quotes. I've just I've kept this simple and and now notice with me as we come to Matthew chapter six. You can't serve two masters. I'm going to read one verse from this chapter. Dwight L. Moody said, I do not see how any Christian, most of all a Christian minister, can go into these secret lodges with unbelievers. Have a list of people that spoke against the lodge, and even many of them came out of the lodge. John Wesley, Alexander Campbell, Daniel Webster, John Hancock, Dwight L. Moody, R.A. Torrey, Charles Saney, John Adams, John, James Madison, a number of others. Why do people join the lodge? Well, there's many reasons. I guess the brotherhood, the fact of making you feel important because you've got a secret that nobody else knows. I mean, there's a number of economic reasons. A man approached me before I ever went into the ministry and approached me in the state of Tennessee and said, uh, we'd like you to consider uh, joining the lodge. said, you're a good candidate, and it just about offended me. We were riding along in a Jeep. Uh, in the, I was in, in the military at the time, and, and uh, we was riding along in the Jeep, and uh, I said, what do you mean? And, uh, well, of course, you have to be approached. You have to be invited. You just don't go and knock on the door and say, hey, I want to join the lodge. The time I got through witnessing to him, he didn't want me in there. He did not want me in there. Now, we're going to close here in this passage. And as we come to a close, I want you to keep in mind that the Masonic motto is making good men better. You say, is there anything for the women? The Eastern Star. The Eastern Star. It's an auxiliary organization for wives and adult daughters of Masons. Then there's a, there is a um, division for the children. Let me give you just a few other quotes here before I close from Albert Pike. Famous men. Many famous men who were 33 degree Masons. I have a list of many. Leaders in politics, in religion, business, leaders in satanic occults. You would not believe some of the names that I have. I believe that John Dewey was one, the father of public education. Many professional people, such as doctors and lawyers and bankers and people like that are involved in it. Many religious people, in fact, gave you a list of names. You would be shocked at some of the preachers that are 33-degree Masons, or at least in the Masonic Lodge. Joseph Smith and Brigham Young were Masons, and that's why that whenever you look at, if you ever study uh, Mormonism, and you look at the temple and all the things that go in, uh, the, the worship there in the temple, the ceremonies, they resemble the ceremonies in the Masonic Lodge. They're very, very close. I don't know if you've ever studied that or not. But uh, they're very close, the rituals and the ceremonies and symbols in those two organizations. Have a long list of politicians, presidents and vice presidents, at least 14 American presidents and at least 18 vice presidents were in the Masonic Lodge. Long list of people all over the world. Businessmen. Music, even in the classical scene, Mozart. In movies, Walt Disney. Gene Autry was supposed to have been a Mason, John Wayne, Roy Rogers, and Clark Gable. Satanic leaders. Voltar, Mark Twain also were supposed to have been Masons. I'm careful about reading the list because I have, when I... I got a list, and I have not searched each one of those out. And it doesn't really matter to me, but I just thought there's been many uh, Masons in politics, movies, in, uh, uh, in business. Albert Pike made this statement in reference to light and darkness. And on the list, on the list, this is going to be the last quote. And he made this statement. He said, Masonry is a search 
for light and the light of masonry is based on the Kabbalah. That is the Jewish mysticism. Pike speaks of Lucifer as the light bearer. Quote, Lucifer, the son of the morning, is it he who bears the light and with its splendor and intolerable blind, feeble, sensual, or selfish souls? We know that the Bible identifies Lucifer as Satan, an angel of light. Paganism says that Satan is a light bearer and enlightens men. Masonry claims, now listen, they claim to be the light that awakens men and Freemasons are called, are you listening, are you ready? They're called the sons of light because all others are in darkness and they have not received that light. 33 degrees. Masons go through these 33 degrees in continual search for the light. They talk about the light a lot and knowledge and secret knowledge and the lost name of God that they have reclaimed. Masons conceal its secrets secrets except to the elect. They conceal its secrets except to the elect. You're at liberty tonight to look through any of this material laying here on the pulpit. If you'd just like to open it up and look at it, you're free to do so. Let's close in Matthew chapter 6. Thank God I'm a Christian. Amen? Amen? And I'm not deceived In this area right here. He said in Matthew 6 and verse 24. He said, no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other. Or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. You know what I have to do? Well, I've met a lot of nice and good people in Sonic Lodge. And there's many in Freemasonry that do a lot of good deeds. They have their hospitals and their charities and things of that nature. You have the Shriners. They're actually two different organizations, but I think you have to be a 32nd degree Mason in order to be a Shriner. I believe that's the way it is. You know those people that ride around those little silly motorcycles in the parade? You've seen them, haven't you? Clowns. Now, I know there's some, some, some good people, I guess, that are involved, but let me ask you a question tonight. When you analyze this with the Word of God, and we close with this passage, how can a man be a Christian and spend his life in the Messiah Lodge. They don't fit together. They're not compatible. Now, I could understand a man getting saved and seeing the wickedness in there and so forth and coming out of that. But to stay in there the rest of your life and claiming to be a follower of Jesus Christ, I don't understand that. Well, we're going to stop right here. Got another great subject next Sunday night.